The Glass Castle, Part 2 The Desert At twilight once, the sun had slid behind the Palin Mountains. The bats came out and swirled through the sky above the shacks of Midland. The old lady who lived next door warned us away from bats. She called them flying rats and said one got caught in her hair once and went crazy clawing at her scalp. But I loved those ugly little bats, the way they darted past, their wings in a furious blur. That explained how they had sonar detectors, kind of like the ones in nuclear submarines. Brian and I would throw pebbles, hoping the bats would think they were bugs and eat them, and the weight of the pebbles would pull them down and we could keep them as pets, tying a long string to their claws so they could still fly around. I wanted to train one to hang upside down from my finger, but those darn bats were too clever to fall for our trick. The bats were out, swooping and screeching, when we left Midland for Blythe. Earlier that day, Mama told us that the baby had decided it was big enough to come out soon and join the family. Once we were on the road, Dad and Mom got in a big fight over how many months she'd been pregnant. Mom said she was ten months pregnant. Dad, who had fixed someone's transmission earlier that day and used the money he'd made to buy a bottle of tequila, said she probably lost track somewhere. I always carry children longer than most women, Mom said. Lori was in my womb for fourteen months. Bullshit, Dad said. Unless Lori's part elephant. Don't you make fun of me or my children, Mom yelled. Some babies are premature. Mine were all post-mature. That's why they're so smart. Their brains have longer to develop. Dad said something about freaks of nature, and Mom called Dad a Mr. Know-it-all smarty pants who refused to believe that she was special. Dad said something about Jesus H. Christ on a goddamn crutch, not taking much time to gestate. Mom got upset at Dad's blasphemy, reached her foot over to the driver's side, and stomped on the brake. It was the middle of the night, and Mom bolted out of the car and ran into the darkness. You crazy bitch! Dad hollered. Get your goddamn ass back in the car. You make me, Mr. Tough Guy, she screamed as she ran away. Dad jerked the steering wheel to one side and drove off the road into the desert after her. Lori, Brian, and I braced one another with our arms like we always did when Dad went on some wild chase that we knew would get bumpy. Dad stuck his head out the window as he drove, hollering at Mom, calling her a stupid whore and a stinking cunt, and ordering her to get back in the car. Mom refused. She was ahead of us, bobbing in and out of the desert brush. Since she never used curse words, she was calling Dad names like Blankety Blank and Worthless Drunk So-and-So. Dad stopped the car and then jammed down the accelerator and popped the clutch. We shot forward toward Mom, who screamed and jumped out of the way. Dad turned around and went for her again. It was a moonless night, so we couldn't see Mom except when she ran into the beam of the headlights. She kept looking over our shoulders, her eyes wide like a hunted animal's. We kids cried and begged Dad to stop, but he ignored us. I was even more worried about the baby inside Mom's swollen belly than I was about her. The car bounced on holes and rocks, brush scratching against its sides and dust coming through the open windows. Finally, Dad quartered Mom against some rocks. I was afraid he might smush her with the car, but instead he got out and dragged her back, legs flailing, and threw her into the car. We banged back through the desert and onto the road. Everyone was quiet except Mom, who was sobbing that she really did carry Lori for 14 months. Mom and Dad made up the next day, and by late afternoon, Mom was cutting Dad's hair in the living room of the apartment we'd rented in Blythe. He'd taken off his shirt and was sitting backward on a chair with his head bowed and his hair combed forward. Mom was snipping away while Dad pointed out the parts that were still too long. When they were finished, Dad combed his hair back and announced that Mom had done a hell of a fine shearing job. Our apartment was in a one-story cinder block building on the outskirts of town. It had a big blue and white plastic sign in the shape of an oval and a boomerang that said the LBJ Apartments. I thought it stood for Lori, Brian, and Jeanette, but Mom said LBJ was the initials of the president, who, she added, was a crook and a warmonger. A few truck drivers and cowboys had rooms at the LBJ Apartments, but most of the other people who lived there were migrant workers and their families, and we heard them talking through the thin sheetrock walls. Mom said it was one of the bonuses of living in the LBJ Apartments, because we'd be able to pick up a little Spanish without even trying. Blythe was in California, but the Arizona border was within spitting distance. People who lived there liked to say the town was 150 miles west of Phoenix, 250 miles east of Los Angeles, and smack dab in the middle of nowhere. But they always said it like they were bragging. Mom and Dad weren't exactly crazy about Blythe. Too civilized, they said, and downright unnatural, too, since no town the size of Blythe had any business existing out in the Mojave Desert. It was near the Colorado River, founded back in the 19th century by some guy who figured he could get rich turning the desert into farmland. He dug a bunch of irrigation ditches that drained water out of the Colorado River to grow lettuce and grapes and broccoli right there in the middle of all the cactus and sagebrush. 
Dad got disgusted every time we drove past one of those farm fields with their irrigation ditches wide as moats. It's a goddamn perversion of nature, he'd say. If you want to live in the farmland, haul your sorry ass off to Pennsylvania. If you want to live in the desert, eat prickly pears, not iceberg pansy-ass lettuce. That's right, Mom would say. Prickly pears have more vitamins anyway. Living in a big city like Blythe meant I had to wear shoes. It also meant I had to go to school. School wasn't so bad. I was in the first grade, and my teacher, Miss Cook, always chose me to read aloud when the principal came into the classroom. The other students didn't like me very much because I was so tall and pale and skinny and always raised my hand too fast and waved it frantically in the air whenever Miss Cook asked a question. A few days after I started school, four Mexican girls followed me home and jumped me in an alleyway near the LBJ apartments. They beat me up pretty bad, pulling my hair and tearing my clothes and calling me a teacher's pet and a matchstick. I came home that night with scraped knees and elbows and a busted lip. Looks to me like you got in a fight, Dad said. He was sitting at the table, taking apart an old alarm clock with Brian. Just a little dust up, I said. That was the word Dad always used after he'd been in a fight. How many were there? Six, I lied. That split lip okay? He asked. This little old scratch, I asked. He should have seen what I did to them. That's my girl, Dad said, and went back to the clock. But Brian kept looking over at me. The next day, when I got to the alley, the Mexican girls were waiting for me. Before they could attack, Brian jumped out from behind a clump of sagebrush, waving a yucca branch. Brian was shorter than me and just as skinny, with freckles across his nose and sandy red hair that fell into his eyes. He wore my hand-me-down pants, which I had inherited from Lori, and then passed on to him, and they were always sliding off his bony behind. Just back off now, and everyone can walk away with all their limbs still attached, Brian said. It was another one of Dad's lines. The Mexican girls stared at him before bursting into laughter. They surrounded him. Brian did fairly well fending them off until the yucca branch broke. Then he disappeared beneath a flurry of swinging fists and kicking feet. I grabbed the biggest rock I could find and hit one of the girls on the head with it. From the jolt in my arm, I thought I'd cracked her skull. She sank to her knees. One of her friends pushed me to the ground and kicked me in the face, and they all ran off. The girl I'd hit holding her head as she staggered along. Brian and I sat up. His face was covered with sand. All I could see were his blue eyes peering out and a couple of spots of blood seeping through. I wanted to hug him, but that would have been too weird. Brian stood up and gestured for me to follow him. He climbed through a hole in the chain link fence fence he had discovered that morning and ran into the iceberg lettuce farm next to an apartment building. I followed him through the rows of big green leaves, and we eventually settled down to feast, burying our faces in the huge wet heads of lettuce and eating until our stomachs ached. I guess we scared them off pretty good, I said to Brian. I guess, he said. He never liked to brag, but I could tell he was proud that he'd taken on four bigger, tougher kids, even if they were girls. Lettuce war, Brian shouted. He tossed a half-eaten head at me like a grenade. We ran along the rows, pulling up heads and throwing them at each other. A crop duster flew overhead. We waved as it made a pass above the field. A cloud sprayed from behind the plane, and a fine white powder screen came sprinkling down on our heads. Two months after we moved to Blythe, when Mom said she was 12 months pregnant, she at last gave birth. After she'd been in the hospital for two days, we all drove out to pick her up. Dad left us kids waiting in the car with the engine idling while he went in for Mom. Mom was cradling a bundle in her arms and giggling sort of guiltily, like she'd stolen a candy bar from a dime store. I figured they had checked out Rex Wall style. What is it? Lori asked as we sped away. Girl, Mom said. Mom handed me the baby. I was going to turn six in a few months, and Mom said I was mature enough to hold her the entire way home. The baby was pink and wrinkly, but absolutely beautiful, with big blue eyes, soft wisps of blonde hair, and the tiniest fingernails I'd ever seen. She moved in, confused, jerky motions, as if she could understand why Mom's belly wasn't still around her. I promised her I'd always take care of her. The baby went without a name for weeks. Mom said she wanted to study it first, the way she would the subject of a painting. She had a lot of arguments over what the name should be. I wanted to call her Rosita, after the prettiest girl in my class, but Mom said the name was too Mexican. I thought we weren't supposed to be prejudiced, I said. It's not being prejudiced, Mom said. It's a matter of accuracy and labeling. She told us that both our grandmothers were angry because neither Lori nor I had been named after them, so she decided to call the baby Lily Ruth Maureen. 
Lily was my mom's mother's name, and Irma Ruth was dad's mother's name. But we'd call the baby Maureen, a name mom liked because it was a diminutive of Mary, so she'd also be naming the baby after herself, but pretty much no one would know it. That, dad told us, would make everyone happy except his mom, who hated the name Ruth and wanted the baby called Irma, and mom's mom, who would hate sharing her namesake with dad's mom. A few days after Maureen was born, a squad car tried to pull us over because the brake lights on the green caboose weren't working. Dad took off. He said that if the cops stopped us, they'd find out that we had no registration or insurance and that the license plate had been taken off another car, and they'd arrest us all. After barreling down the highway, he made a screeching U-turn. With us kids feeling like the car was going to tumble over on its side, but the squad car made one too. Dad peeled through Blythe at a hundred miles an hour, ran a red light, got the wrong way up a one-way street, the other cars honking and pulling over. He made a few more turns, then headed down an alley and found an empty gar garage to hide in. We heard the sound of the siren a couple blocks away, and then it faded. Dad said that since the Gestapo would have their eyes out for the green caboose, we'd have to leave it in the garage and walk home. The next day, he announced that Blythe had become a little too hot, and we were hitting the road again. This time, he knew where we were going. Dad had been doing some research and settled on a town in northern Nevada called Battle Mountain. There was gold in Battle Mountain, Ted said, and he intended to go after it with a prospector. Finally, we were going to strike it rich. Mom and Dad rented a great big U-Haul truck. Mom explained that since only she and Dad could fit in the front of the U-Haul, Lori, Brian, and Maureen and I were in for a treat. We got to ride in the back. It would be fun, she said, a real adventure. But there wouldn't be any light, so we would have to use all our resources to entertain one another. Plus, we were not allowed to talk. Since it was illegal to ride in the back, anyone who heard us might call the cops. Mom told us the trip would be about 14 hours if we took the highway, but we should tack on another couple of hours because we might make some scenic detours. We packed up the furniture we had. There wasn't much, mostly parts for the prospector and a couple of chairs and Mom's oil paintings and art supplies. When we were ready to leave, Mom wrapped Maureen in a lavender blanket and passed her to me, and we kids all climbed it at the back of the U-Haul. Dad closed the doors. It was pitch black and the air smelled stale and dusty. We were sitting on the ribbed wooden floor on frayed, stained blankets used to wrap furniture, feeling for one another with our hands. Here goes the adventure, I whispered. Shh, Lori said. The U-Haul started up and lurched forward. Maureen let loose with a loud, high-pitched wail. I shushed her and rocked her and patted her, but she kept crying. So I gave her to Lori, who whispered sing-song into her ear and told jokes. That didn't work either, so we begged Maureen to please stop crying. Then we just put our hands over our ears. After a while, it got cold and uncomfortable in the back of the dark U-Haul. The engine made the floor vibrate, and we'd all go tumbling whenever we had a bump. Several hours passed. By then, we were all dying to pee and wondering if Dad was going to pull over for a rest stop. Suddenly, with a bang, we hit a huge pothole, and the back doors on the U-Haul flew open. The wind shrieked through the compartment. We were afraid we were going to get sucked out, and we all shrank back against the prospector. The moon was out. We could see the glow from the U-Haul's taillights, and the road we'd come down stretching back through the slivery desert. The unlocked doors swung back and forth with loud clangs. Since the furniture was stored between us and the cabin, we couldn't knock on the wall to get Mom and Dad's attention. We banged on the sides of the U-Haul and hollered as loud as we could, but the engine was too noisy and they didn't hear us. Brian crawled to the back of the van. When one of the doors swung open, he grabbed at it, but it flew open, jerking him forward. I thought the door was going to drag Brian out, but he jumped back just in time and scrambled along the wooden floor toward Lori and me. Brian and Lori held tight to the prospector, which Dad had tied securely with ropes. I was holding Maureen, who, for some strange reason, had stopped crying. I wedged myself into a corner. It seemed like we'd have to ride it out. Then a pair of headlights appeared way in the distance behind us. We watched as the car slowly caught up with the U-Haul. After a few minutes, it pulled up right behind us, and its headlights caught us there in the back of the cab. The car started honking and flashing its brights. Then it pulled up and passed us. The driver must have signaled Mom and Dad because the U-Haul slowed to a stop, and Dad came running back with a flashlight. What the hell is going on? he asked. He was furious. We tried to explain that it wasn't our fault the doors blew open, but he was still angry. I knew that he was scared, too. Maybe even more scared than angry. Was that a cop? Brian asked. No, Dad said. And you're sure as hell lucky it wasn't, or he'd be hauling your asses off to jail. After we peed, we climbed back into the truck and watched as Dad closed the doors. 
The darkness enveloped us again. We could hear Dad locking the doors and double-checking them. The engine restarted, and we continued on our way. Battle Mountain had started out as a mining post, settled a hundred years earlier by people hoping to strike it rich. But if anyone ever had struck it rich in Battle Mountain, they must have moved somewhere else to spend their fortune. Nothing about the town was grand except the big empty sky and off in the distance the stony purple Tuscarora Mountains running down the table flat desert. The main street was wide, with sun bleached cars and pickups parked at an angle to the curb, and only a few blocks long flanked on both sides with low flat roofed buildings made of adobe or brick. A single street light flashed red day and night. Along Main Street was a grocery store, a drug store, a Ford dealership, a Greyhound bus station, and two big casinos, the Owl Club and the Nevada Hotel. The buildings, which seemed puny under the huge sky, had neon signs that didn't look like they were on during the day because the sun was so bright. We moved into a wooden building on the edge of town that had once been a railroad depot. It was two stories tall and painted in industrial green and was so close to the railroad tracks that you could wave to the engineer from the front window. Our new home was one of the oldest buildings in town. Mom probably proudly told us with a real frontier quality to it. Mom and Dad's bedroom was on the second floor where the station manager once had his office. We kids slept downstairs in what had been the waiting room. The old restrooms were still there but the toilet had been ripped out of one and the bathtub put in its place. The ticket booth had been converted into a kitchen. Some of the original benches were still bolted to the unpainted wood walls, and you could see the dark, worn spots where prospectors and miners and their wives and children had sat waiting for the train, their behinds polishing the wood. Since we didn't have money for furniture, we improvised. A bunch of huge wooden spools, the kind that hold industrial cable, had been dumped on the side of the tracks not far from the house, so we rolled them home and turned them into the tables. What kind of fools would waste money on store-bought tables when they can have these for free? Dad said as he pounded the tops of the spools to show us how sturdy they were. For chairs, we used some smaller spools and a few crates. Instead of beds, we kids each slept in a big cardboard box, like the ones refrigerators get delivered in. A little while after we moved into the depot, we heard Mom and Dad talking about buying us kids real beds, and we still said that they shouldn't do it. We liked our boxes. They made going to bed seem like an adventure. Shortly after we moved into the depot, Mom decided that what we really needed was a piano. Dad found a cheap upright when a saloon in the next town over went out of business, and we borrowed a neighbor's pickup to bring it home. We slid it off the pickup down a ramp, but it was too heavy to carry. To get it into the depot, Dad devised a system of ropes and pulleys that he attached to the piano in the front yard and ran through the house and out the back door where they were tied to the pickup. The plan was for Mom to ease the truck forward, pulling the piano into the house while Dad and we kids guided up a ramp of planks and through the front door. Ready? Dad hollered when we were all in our positions. Okie doke, Mom shouted. But instead of easing forward, Mom, who had never quite gotten the hang of driving, hit the gas pedal hard, and the truck shot ahead. The piano jerked out of our hands, sending us lurching forward, and bounced into the house, splintering the door frame. Dad screamed at Mom to slow down, but she kept going and dragged the screeching, cord-banging piano across the depot floor and right through the rear door, splintering its frame, too then out into the backyard where it came to rest next to a thorny bush. Dad came running through the house. What the Sam Hill were you doing? He yelled at Mom. I told you to go slow. I was only doing 25, Mom said. You get mad at me when I go that slow on the highway. She looked behind her and saw the piano sitting in the backyard. Oopsie daisy, she said. Mom wanted to turn around and drag it back into the house from the other direction, but Dad said that was impossible because the railroad tracks were too close to the front door to get the pickup in position. So the piano stayed where it was. On the days Mom felt inspired, she took her sheet music and one of our spool chairs outside and pounded away on her music back there. Most pianists never get the chance to play in the grand out of doors, she said, and now the whole neighborhood can enjoy the music too. Dad got a job as an electrician at a barite mine. He left early and came home early in the afternoons. We all played games. Dad taught us cards. He tried to show us how to be steely-eyed poker players, but I wasn't very good. Dad said you could read my face like a traffic light. Even though I wasn't much of a bluffer, I'd sometimes win a hand because I was always getting excited by even mediocre cards, like a pair of fives, which made Brian and Lori think I'd been dealt aces. Dad also invented games for us to play, like the Ergo game, in which he'd make two statements of fact, and we had to answer a question based on those statements, or else say, insufficient information to draw a conclusion, and explain why. 
When Dad wasn't there, we invented our own games. We didn't have many toys, but you didn't need toys to play in a place like Battle Mountain. We'd get a piece of cardboard and go tobogganing down the depot's narrow staircase. We'd jump off the roof of the depot using an army surplus blanket as our parachute and letting our legs buckle under us when we hit the ground, like Dad had taught us real parachutes do. We'd put a piece of scrap metal or a penny if we were feeling extravagant on the railroad tracks right before the train came. After the train had roared by, the massive wheels turning, we'd run to get our newly flattened, hot and shiny piece of metal. The thing we liked to do most was go exploring in the desert. We'd get up at dawn, my favorite time, when the shadows were long and purple and you still had the whole day ahead of you. Sometimes Dad went with us, and we'd march through the sagebrush military style, with Dad calling out orders in a sing-song chant. Up, two, three, four. And then we'd stop and do push-ups, or Dad would hold out his arms so we could do pull-ups on it. Mostly, Brian and I went exploring by ourselves. That desert was filled with all sorts of amazing treasures. We had moved to Battle Mountain because of the gold in the area, but the desert also had tons of other mineral deposits. There was silver and copper and uranium and barite, which Dad said oil drilling, drilling rigs used. Mom and Dad could tell that kind of minerals and ore were in the ground from the color of the rock and soil, and they taught us what to look for. Iron was in the red rocks, copper in the green. There was so much turquoise, nuggets, and even big chunks of it lying on the desert floor that Brian and I could fill our pockets with it until the weight practically pulled our pants down. You could also find arrowheads and fossils and old bottles that had turned deep purple from lying under the broiling sun for years. You could find the sun-parched skulls of coyotes and empty tortoise shells and the rattles and shed skins of rattlesnakes. And you could find big bullfrogs that had, been sta that had stayed in the sun too long and were completely dried up and as light as a piece of paper. On Sunday night, if Dad had money, we'd all go to the Owl Club for dinner. The Owl Club was world famous, according to the sign, where a hoot owl wearing a chef's hat pointed the way to the entrance. Off to one side was a room with rows of slot machines that were constantly clinking and ticking and flashing lights. Mom said the slot players were hypnotized. Dad said they were damn fools. Never play the slots, Dad told us. They're for suckers who rely on luck. Dad knew all about the statistics, and he explained how the casinos stacked the odds against the slot players. When Dad gambled, he preferred poker and pool. Games of skill, not chance. Whoever coined the phrase, a man's got to play the hand that was dealt him, was certainly one piss-poor bluffer, Dad said. The old Owl Club had a bar where groups of men with sunburned necks huddled together over beers and cigarettes. They all knew Dad whenever he walked in. They insulted him in a loud, funny way that was meant to be friendly. This joint must be going to hell in a handbasket if they're letting in sorry-ass characters like you, they'd shout. Now my presence here has a positively elevating effect compared to you mangy coyotes, Dad would yell back. They'd all throw their heads back and laugh and slap one another between the shoulder blades. We always sat at one of the red booths. Such good manners, the waitress would exclaim, because Mom and Dad made us say sir and ma'am and yes please and thank you. They're damn smart too, Dad would declare. Finest damn kids ever walk the planet. And we'd smile and order hamburgers or chili dogs and milkshakes and big plates of onion rings that glisten with hot grease. The waitress brought the food on to the table and poured the milkshakes from a sweating metal container into our glasses. There was always some left over, and she kept the container on the table for us to finish. Looks like you hit the jackpot and got something extra, she'd say with a wink. We always left the Owl Club so stuffed we could hardly walk. Let's waddle home, kids, Dad would say. The Bearite mine where Dad had worked had a commissary, and the mine owner deducted our bill and the rent for the depot out of Dad's paycheck every month. At the beginning of each week, we went to the commissary and brought home bags and bags of food. Mom said only people brainwashed by advertising bought prepared food, such as SpaghettiOs and TV dinners. We bought the basics. Sacks of flour, cornmeal, powdered milk, onions, potatoes, 20-pound bags of rice or pinto beans, salt, sugar, yeast for making bread, cans of jack mackerel, canned ham, or a fat slab of bologna, and for dessert, cans of sliced peaches. Mom didn't like cooking much. Why spend the afternoon making a meal that would be gone in an hour? she asked us. With the same amount of time, I can do a painting that will last forever. So once a week or so, she'd fix a big cast iron vat of something like fish or rice or usually beans. We'd all sort through the beans together, picking out the rocks when Mom would soak them overnight, boil them the next day with an old ham bone to give them flavor, and for the entire week, we'd have beans for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. If the beans started going bad, we'd just put extra spice in them like the Mexicans at the LBJ apartments always did. We bought so much food that we never had much money come payday. One payday, Dad owned the mine, owed the mine company 11 cents. 
He thought it was funny and told them to put it on his tab. Dad almost never went out drinking at night like he used to. He stayed home with us. After dinner, the whole family stretched out on the benches and the floor of the depot and read, with a dictionary in the middle of the room so we kids could look up words we didn't know. Sometimes I discussed the definitions with Dad, and if we didn't agree with what the dictionary writers said, we sat down and wrote a letter to the publishers. They'd write back defending their position, which would prompt an even longer letter from Dad, and if they replied again, so would he, until we stopped hearing from the dictionary people. Mom read everything. Charles Dickens, William Faulkner, Henry Miller, Pearl Buck. She even read James Meichner, apologetically, saying she knew it wasn't great literature, but she couldn't help herself. Dad preferred science and math books, biographies and history. We kids read whatever Mom brought home from her weekly trips to the library. Brian read thick adventure books, ones written by guys like Zane Gray. Laurie especially loved Freddy the Pig and all the Oz books. I liked the Laura Ingalls Wilder stories and the We Were There series about kids who lived at great historical moments. But my very favorite was Black Beauty. Occasionally on those nights when we were all reading together, a train would thunder by, shaking the house and rattling the windows. The noise was thunderous, but after we'd been there a while, we didn't even hear it. Mom and Dad enrolled us in the Mary S. Black Elementary School, a long, low building with an asphalt playground that turned gooey in the hot sun. My second grade class was filled with the children of miners and gamblers, scabby kneed and dusty from playing in the desert with uneven home scissor bangs. Our teacher, Miss Page, was a small, pinched woman, given to sudden rages and savage thrashings with a ruler. Mom and Dad had already taught me nearly everything Miss Page was teaching the class. Since I wanted the other kids to like me, I didn't raise my hand all the time the way I did in Blythe. Dad accused me of coasting. Sometimes he made me do my arithmetic homework in binary numbers because he said I needed to be challenged. Before class, I'd have to recopy it into Arabic numbers, but one day I didn't have time, so I turned in the assignment in its binary version. What's this? Miss Page said. She pressed her lips together as she studied the circles and lines that covered my paper, then looked up at me suspiciously. Is this a joke? I tried to explain to her about binary numbers and how they were the system that computers used and how Dad said they were far superior to other numeric systems. Miss Page stared at me. It wasn't the assignment, she said impatiently. She made me stay late and redo the homework. I didn't tell Dad because I knew we'd come to school to debate Miss Page about the virtues of various numeric systems. Lots of other kids lived in our neighborhood, which was known as the tracks, and after school we all played together. We played red light, green light, tag, football, red rover, and nameless games that involved running hard, keeping up with the pack, and not crying if you fell down. All the families who lived around the tracks were tight on cash. Some were tighter than others, but all of us kids were scrawny and sunburned and wore faded shorts and raggedy shirts and sneakers with holes or no shoes at all. What was most important to us was who ran the fastest and whose daddy wasn't a wimp. My dad was not only not a wimp, he came out to play with the gang, running alongside us, tossing us up in the air and wrestling against the entire pack without getting hurt. Kids from the tracks came knocking at the door, and when I answered, they asked, Can your dad come out and play? Lori, Brian, and I, and even Maureen, could go pretty much anywhere and do just about anything we wanted. Mom believed that children shouldn't be burdened with lots of rules and restrictions. Dad whipped us with his belt, but never out of anger, and only if we backtalked or disobeyed a direct order, which was rare. The only rule was that we had to come home when the streetlights went on. And use your common sense, Mom said. She felt it was good for kids to do what they wanted because they learned a lot from their mistakes. Mom was not one of those fussy mothers who got upset when you came home dirty or played in the mud and fell and cut yourself. She said people should get things like that out of their system when they're young. Once an old nail ripped my thigh while I was climbing over a fence at my friend Carla's house. Carla's mother thought I should go to the hospital for stitches and a tetanus shot. Nothing but a minor flesh wound, Mom declared after studying the deep gash. People these days run to the hospital every time their skin, they skin their knees, she added. We're becoming a nation of sissies. And with that, she sent me back out to play. Some of the rocks I found while I was exploring out in the desert were so beautiful I could not bear the idea of leaving them there. So I started a collection. Brian helped me with it, and together we found garnet and granite and obsidian and Mexican crazy lace, and more and more turquoise. Dad made necklaces for Mom out of all the turquoise. 
We discovered large sheets of mica that you could pound into powder and then rub all over your body so you'd shimmer under the Nevada sun as if you were coated with diamonds. Lots of times, Brian and I thought we'd found gold, and we'd stagger home with an entire bucket full of sparkling nuggets. But it was always iron pyrite, fool's gold. Some of it Dad said we should keep, because it was actually pretty good quality for fool's gold. My favorite rocks to find were geodes, which Mom said came from the volcanoes that erupted to form the Tuscarora Mountains millions of years ago, during the Miocene period. From the outside, geodes looked like boring round rocks, but when you broke them open with a chisel and a hammer, the insides were hollow like a cave, and the walls were covered with glittering white quartz crystals or sparkling purple amethysts. I kept my rock collection behind the house next to Mom's piano, which was getting a little weathered. Lori and Brian and I would use the rocks to decorate the graves of our pets that had died, or of the dead animals we found and decided should get a proper burial. I also held rock sales. I didn't have that many customers because I charged hundreds of dollars for a piece of flint. In fact, the only person who ever bought one of my rocks was Dad. He came out behind the house one day with a pocket full of change and was startled when he saw the price tags I had taped to each rock. Honey, your inventory might move a little faster if you dropped your prices, he said. I explained that all my rocks were incredibly valuable, and I'd rather keep them all than sell them for less than they were worth. Dad gave me his crooked smile. Sounds like you thought this through pretty well, he said. He told me he had his heart set on buying a particular piece of rose quartz, but didn't have the $600 I was charging, so I cut the price to 500 and let him have it on credit. Brian and I loved to go to the dump. We looked for treasures among the discarded stoves and refrigerators, the broken furniture and stacks of bald tires. We chased after the desert rats that lived in the wrecked cars, or caught tadpoles and frogs in the scum-topped pond. Buzzards circled overhead, and the air was filled with dragonflies the size of small birds. There were no trees to speak of in Battle Mountain, but one corner of the dump had huge piles of railroad ties and rotting lumber that were great for climbing and carving your initials on. We called it the woods. Toxic and hazardous wastes were stored in another corner of the dump, where you could find old batteries, oil drums, paint cans, and bottles with skulls and crossbones. Brian and I decided some of this stuff would make for a neat scientific experiment. So we filled up a couple of boxes with different bottles and jars and took them to an abandoned shed we named our laboratory. At first we mixed things together, hoping they would explode, but nothing happened. So I decided we should conduct an experiment to see if any of the stuff was flammable. The next day after school we came back to the laboratory with a box of Dad's matches. We unscrewed the lids of some of the jars and I dropped in matches, but still nothing happened. So we mixed up a batch of what Brian called nuclear fuel, pouring different liquids into a can. When I tossed in the match, a cone of flame shot up with a whoosh, like a jet afterburner. Brian and I were knocked to our feet. When we stood up, one of the walls was on fire. I yelled to Brian that we had to get out of there, but he was throwing sand at the fire, saying that we had to put it out or we'd get in trouble. The flames were spreading toward the door, eating up that dry old wood in no time. I kicked out a board in the back wall and squeezed through. When Brian didn't follow, I ran up the street calling for help. I saw Dad walking home from work. We ran back to the shack. Dad kicked in more of the wall and pulled Brian out, coughing. I thought Dad would be furious, but he wasn't. He was sort of quiet. We stood on the street, watching the flames devour the shack. Dad had an arm around each of us. He said it was an incredible coincidence that we happened to be, he happened to be walking by. Then he pointed to the top of the fire, where the snapping yellow flames dissolved into an invisible shimmery heat that made the desert beyond seem to waver like a mirage. Dad told us that zone was known in physics as the boundary between turbulence and order. It's a place where no rules apply, or at least they haven't figured them out yet, he said. You all got a little too close to it today. None of us kids got allowances. When we wanted money, we walked along the roadside picking up beer cans and bottles that we redeemed for two cents each. Brian and I also collected scrap metal that we sold for the junk dealer for a penny a pound. Three cents a pound for copper. After we redeemed the bottles or sold the scrap metal, we walked into town to the drugstore next door to the Owl Club. There were so many rows and rows of delicious candies to choose from, but we spent an hour trying to decide how to spend the ten cents we'd each made. We'd pick a piece of candy, and then as we got ready to pay for it, change our minds and pick another piece, until the man who owned the store got mad and told us to stop fingering all his candy and make a purchase and get out. Brian's favorite was the giant sweet tart candies, which he licked until his tongue was so raw it bled. I loved chocolate, but it was gone too quickly, so I usually got a sugar daddy, which lasted practically half the day, and always had a funny poem printed in pink letters on the stick, like, To keep your feet from falling asleep, wear loud socks that can't be beat. 
On our way back from the candy store, Brian and I like to spy on the Green Lantern, a big dark green house with a sagging porch right near the highway. Mom said it was a cat house, but I never saw any cats there, only women wearing bathing suits or short dresses who sat or lay out on the porch, waving at the cars that drove by. There were Christmas lights over the door all year round, and Mom said that was how you could tell it was a cat house. Cars would stop in front, and men would get out and duck inside. I couldn't figure out what went on in the Green Lantern, and Mom refused to discuss it. She would say only that bad things happened there, which made the Green Lantern a place of irresistible mystery to us. Brian and I would hide behind the sagebrush across the highway, trying to peer inside the front door when someone went in or out, but we could never see what was going on. A couple of times we sneaked up close and tried to look at the windows, but they were painted black. Once a woman on the porch saw us in the brush and waved to us, and we ran away, shrieking. One day, when Brian and I were hiding in the sagebrush, spying, I double-deared him to go talk to the woman lying on the porch. Brian was almost six by then, a year younger than me, and wasn't afraid of anything. He hitched up his pants, handed me his half-eaten sweet tart for safekeeping, walked across the street, and went right up to the woman. She had long black hair. Her eyes were outlined with the black mascara thick as tar, and she wore a short blue dress printed with black flowers. She had been lying on her side on the porch floor, her head propped up on one arm, but when Brian walked up to her, she rolled over on her stomach and rested her chin on her hand. From my hiding place, I could see that Brian was talking to her, but I couldn't hear what they were saying. Then she reached out a hand to Brian. I held my breath to see what this woman who did bad things inside the Green Lantern was going to do to him. She put her hand on his head and ruffled his hair. Grown-up women always did that to Brian, because his hair was red and he had freckles. It annoyed him. He usually swatted their hands away. But not this time. Instead, he stayed and talked with the woman for a while. When he came back across the highway, he didn't look scared at all. What happened? I asked. Nothing much, Brian said. What'd you talk about? I asked her what goes on inside the Green Lantern, he said. Really? I was impressed. What'd she say? Nothing much, he said. She told me that men came in and the women were nice to them. Oh, I said. Anything else? Nah, Brian said. He started kicking at the dirt like he didn't want to talk about it anymore. She was kind of nice, he said. After that, Brian waved to the woman on the porch of the Green Lantern, and they smiled real big and waved back. But I was still a little afraid of them. Our house in Battle Mountain was filled with animals. They came and went, stray dogs and cats, their puppies and kittens, non-poisonous snakes and lizards and tortoises we caught in the desert. A coyote that seemed pretty tame lived with us for a while, and once Dad brought home a wounded buzzard that we named Buster. He was the ugliest pet we ever owned. Whenever we fed Buster scraps of meat, he turned his head sideways and stared at us out of one angry-looking yellow eye. Then he'd scream and frantically flap his good wing. I was secretly glad when his hurt wing healed and he flew away. Every time we saw Buzzard circling overhead, Dad would say that he recognized Buster among them and that he was coming back to thank us. But I knew Buster would never even consider returning. That Buzzard didn't have one ounce of gratitude in him. We couldn't afford pet food, so the animals had to eat our leftovers, and there usually wasn't much. If they don't like it, they can leave, said Mom. Just because they live here doesn't mean I'm going to wait on them hand and foot. Mom told us that we were actually doing the animals a favor by not allowing them to become dependent on us. That way, if we ever had to leave, they'd be able to get by on their own. Mom liked to encourage self-sufficiency in all living creatures. Mom also believed in letting nature take its course. She refused to kill the flies that always filled the house. She said they were nature's food for the birds and lizards, and the birds and lizards were food for the cats. Kill the flies and you starve the cats, she said. Letting the flies live, in her view, was the same as buying cat food, only cheaper. One day I was visiting my friend Carla when I noticed that her house didn't have any flies, and asked her mother why. She pointed toward a shining gold contraption dangling from the ceiling, which she proudly identified as a shell no-pest strip. She said it could be bought at the filling station that her family had one in every room. The no-pest strips, she explained, released a poison that killed all the flies. What do your lizards eat? I asked. We don't have any lizards either, she said. I went home and told Mom we needed to get a no-pest strip, like Carla's family, but she refused. If it kills the flies, she said, it can't be very good for us. Dad bought a souped-up old Ford Fairlane that winter. And one weekend, when the weather got cold, he announced that we were going swimming at the hot pot. The hot pot was a natural sulfur spring in the desert north of town, surrounded by craggy rocks and quicksand. The water was warm to the touch and spun like rotten eggs. 
It was so full of minerals that rough chalky incrustations had built up along the edges, like a coral reef. Dad was always saying we should buy the hot pot and develop it as a spa. The deeper you went into the water, the hotter it got. It was very deep in the middle. Some people around Battle Mountain said the hot pot had no bottom at all, that it went clean through the center of the earth. A couple of drunks and wild teenagers had drowned there, and people at the Owl Club said when their bodies floated back to the surface, they had been literally boiled. Both Brian and Lori knew how to swim, but I had never learned. Large bodies of water scared me. They seemed unnatural, oddities in the desert towns where we lived. We once stayed in a motel with a swimming pool, and I worked up enough nerve to make my way around the entire length of the pool, clinging to the side. But the hot pot didn't have any neat edges like the swimming pool. There was nothing to cling to. I waded in up to my shoulders. The water around my chest was warm, and the rocks I was standing on felt so hot I wanted to keep moving. I looked back at Dad, who watched me, unsmiling. I tried to push out into the deeper water, but something held me back. Dad dived in and splashed his way toward me. You're going to learn to swim today he said. He put an arm around me and we started across the water. Dad was dragging me. I felt terrified and clutched his neck so tightly that his skin turned white. There, that wasn't so hard, was it? Dad asked when we got to the other side. We started back and this time, when we got to the middle, Dad pried my fingers from around his neck and pushed me away. My arms flailed around and I sank into the hot, smelly water. I instinctively breathed in. Water surged into my nose, mouth, and down my throat. My lungs burned. My eyes were open and the sulfur stinging them, but the water was dark and my hair was wrapped around my face and I couldn't see anything. A pair of hands grabbed me around the waist. Dad pulled me into the shallow water. I was spitting and coughing and breathing in uneven choking gasps. That's okay, Dad said. Catch your breath. When I recovered, Dad picked me up and heaved me back into the middle of the hot pot. Sink or swim, he called out. For the second time, I sank. The water once more filled my nose and lungs. I kicked and flailed and thrashed my way to the surface, gasping for air, and reached out to Dan. But he pulled back, and I didn't feel his hands around me until I'd sunk one more time. He did it again and again, until the realization that he was rescuing me only to throw me back into the water took hold, and so rather than reaching for Dad's hands, I tried to get away from them. I kicked at him and pushed away through the water with my arms, and finally I was able to propel myself beyond his grasp. You're doing it, baby! Dad shouted, you're swimming. I staggered out of the water and sat on the calcified rocks, my chest heaving. Dad came out to the water, too, and tried to hug me, but I wouldn't have anything to do with him, or with Mom, who'd been floating on her back as if nothing were happening, or with Brian or Lori, who gathered around me and were congratulating me. Dad kept telling me that he loved me, that he never would have let me drown, but you can't cling to the side your whole life. That one lesson every parent needs to teach a child is, if you don't want to sink, you better figure out how to swim. What other reason, he asked, would possibly make him do this? Once I got my breath back, I figured he must be right. There was no other way to explain it. Bad news, Lori said one day when I got home from exploring. Dad lost his job. Dad had kept his job for nearly six months, longer than any other. I figured we were through with Battle Mountain and that within a few days we'd be on the move again. I wonder where we'll live next, I said. Lori shook her head. We're staying here, she said. Dad insisted he hadn't exactly lost his job. He would arranged to have himself fired because he wanted to spend more time looking for gold. He had all sorts of plans to make money, she added, inventions he was working on, odd jobs he'd lined up. But for the time being, things might as get a little tight around the house. We all have to help out, Lori said. I thought of what I could do to contribute, besides collecting bottles and scrap metal. I'll cut the prices on my rocks, I said. Lori paused and looked down. I don't think that'll be enough, she said. I guess we can eat less, I said. We have before, Lori said. We did eat less. Once we lost our credit at the commissary, we quickly ran out of food. Sometimes one of Dad's odd jobs would come through or he'd win some money gambling and we'd eat for a few days. Then the money would be gone and the refrigerator would be empty again. Before, whenever we were out of food, Dad was always there, full of ideas and ingenuity. He'd find a can of tomatoes on the back of a shelf that everyone else had missed, or he'd go off for an hour and come back with an armful of vegetables, never telling us where he got them, and whip up a stew. But now he began disappearing a lot. Where, Dad? Maureen asked all the time. She was a year and a half old, and these were almost her first words. 
He's out finding us food and looking for work, I'd say. But I wondered if he didn't really want to be around us unless he could provide for us. I tried to never complain. If we asked Mom about food in a casual way because we didn't want to cause any trouble, she'd simply shrug and say she couldn't make something out of nothing. We kids usually kept our hunger to ourselves, but we were always thinking of food and how to get our hands on it. During recess at school, I'd slip back into the classroom and find something in some other kid's lunch bag that wouldn't be missed. A package of crackers, an apple, and I'd gulp it down so quickly I could barely be able to taste it. If I was playing in a friend's yard, I'd ask if I could use the bathroom, and if no one was in the kitchen, I'd grab something out of the refrigerator or cupboard and take it to the bathroom and eat it there, always making a point of flushing the toilet before leaving. Brian was scavenging, too. One day I discovered him upchucking behind our house. I wanted to know how he could be spewing like that when we hadn't eaten in days. He told me he'd broken into a neighbor's house and stolen a gallon jar of pickles. The neighbor had caught him, but instead of reporting him to the cops, he made Brian eat the entire jar full as punishment. I had to swear I wouldn't tell Dad. A couple of months after Dad lost his job, he came home with a bag of groceries. A can of corn, half gallon of milk, loaf of bread, two tins of deviled ham, a sack of sugar, a stick of margarine. The can of corn disappeared within minutes. Somebody in the family had stolen it, no one except the thief knew who. But Dad was too busy making deviled ham sandwiches to launch an investigation. We ate our fill that night, washing down the sandwiches with big glasses of milk. When I got back from school the next day, I found Lori in the kitchen eating something out of a cup with a spoon. I looked in the refrigerator. There was nothing inside but a half-gone stick of margarine. Lori, what are you eating? Margarine, she said. I wrinkled my nose. Really? Yeah, she said. Mix it with sugar. It tastes just like frosting. I made some. It didn't taste like frosting. It was sort of crunchy, because the sugar didn't dissolve, and it was greasy and left a filmy coat in my mouth. But I ate it all anyway. When Mom got home that evening, she looked in the refrigerator. What happened to the stick of margarine? She asked. We ate it, I said. Mom got angry. She was saving it, she said, to butter the bread. We already ate all the bread, I said. Mom said she was thinking of baking some bread if a neighbor would loan us some flour. I pointed out that the gas company had turned off our gas. Well, Mom said, we should have saved the margarine just in case the gas gets per turn back on. Miracles happen, you know. It was because of my and Lori's selfishness, she said, that if we had any bread, we'd have to eat it without butter. Mom wasn't making any sense to me. I wondered if she had been looking forward to eating the margarine herself. And that made me wonder if she was the one who'd stolen the can of corn the night before, which got me a little mad. It's the only thing to eat in the whole house, I said, raising my voice, I added. I was hungry. Mom gave me a startled look. I'd broken one of our unspoken rules. We were always supposed to pretend our life was one long and incredibly fun adventure. She raised her hand and I thought she was going to hit me. But then she sat down on the spool table and rested her head on her arms. Her shoulders started shaking. I went over and touched her arm. Mom, I said. She shook off my hand, and when she raised her head, her face was swollen and red. It's not my fault if you're hungry, she shouted. Don't blame me. Do you think I like living like this, do you? That night, when Dad came home, he and Mom got into a big fight. Mom was screaming that she was tired of getting all the blame for everything that went wrong. How did this become my problem, she shouted. Why aren't you helping? You spend your whole day at the Owl Club. You act like it's not your responsibility. Dad explained that he was out trying to earn money. He had all sorts of prospects that he was on the brink of realizing. Problem was, he needed cash to make that happen. There was a lot of gold in Battle Mountain, but it was trapped in the ore. It was not like there was a gold nugget lying around for the prospector to sort through. He was perfect, perfecting a technique by which the gold could be leached out of the rock by processing it with cyanide solution. But that took money. Dad told Mom she needed to ask her mother for money to fund the cyanide leaching process he was developing. You want me to beg for my mother again? Mom asked. God damn it, Rosemary. It's not like we're asking for a handout, he yelled. She'd be making an investment. Grandma was always lending us money, Mom said, and she was sick of it. Mom told Dad that Grandma had said if we couldn't take care of ourselves, we could go live in Phoenix in her house. Maybe we should, Mom said. That got Dad really angry. Are you saying I can't take care of my own family? Ask them, Mom snapped. We kids were sitting on the old passenger benches. Dad turned to me. I studied the scuff marks on the floor. Their argument continued the next morning. We kids were downstairs lying in our boxes, listening to them fighting upstairs. 
Mom was carrying on about how things had gotten so desperate around the house that we didn't have anything to eat except margarine, and now that was gone, too. She was sick, she said, of Dad's ridiculous dreams and his stupid plans and his empty promises. I turned to Lori, who was reading a book. Tell them that we like eating margarine, I said. Then maybe they'll stop fighting. Lori shook her head. That'll make Mom think we're taking Dad's side, she said. It would only make it worse. Let them work it out. I knew Lori was right. The only thing to do when Mom and Dad fought was to pretend it wasn't happening or act like it didn't matter. And pretty soon they'd be friends again, kissing and dancing in each other's arms. But this particular argument just would not stop. After going on about the margarine, they started fighting about whether or not some painting Mom had done was ugly. Then they argued about whose fault it was that we lived like we did. Mom told Dad he should get another job. Dad said that if Mom wanted someone in the family to be punching a time clock, then she could get a job. She had a teaching degree, he pointed out. She could work instead of sitting around on her butt all day, painting pictures no one ever wanted to buy. Van Gogh didn't sell any paintings either, Mom said. I'm an artist. Fine, Dad said. Then quit your damn belly aching, or go pedal your ass at the Green Lantern. Mom and Dad's shouting was so loud that you could hear it throughout the neighborhood. Lori, Brian, and I looked at one another. Brian nodded at the front door, and we all went outside and started making sandcastles for scorpions. We figured that if we were all in the front yard acting like the fighting was no big deal, maybe the neighbors would feel the same way. But as the screaming continued, neighbors started gathering on the street. Some were simply curious. Mom and Dad's got into arguments all the time in Battle Mountain, so it didn't seem like a big deal. But this fight was raucous, even by local standards, and some people thought they should step in and break it up. Oh, let them work out their differences, one of the men said. No one's got a right to interfere. So they leaned back against car fenders and fence posts or sat on pickup tailgates as if they were at a rodeo. Suddenly, one of Mom's oil paintings came flying through an upstairs window. Next came her easel. The crowd below scurried back to avoid getting hit. Then Mom's feet appeared in the window, followed by the rest of her body. She was dangling from the second floor, her legs swinging wildly. Dad was holding her by the arms while she tried to hit him in the face. Help! Mom screamed. He's trying to kill me! God damn it, Rosemary, get back in here, Dad said. Don't hurt her, Lori yelled. Mom was swinging back and forth. Her yellow cotton dress had gotten bunched up around her waist, and the crowd could see her white underwear. They were sort of old and baggy, and I was afraid they might fall off altogether. Some of the grown-ups called out, worried that Mom might fall, but one group of kids thought Mom looked like a chimpanzee swinging from a tree, and they began making monkey noises and scratching their armpits and laughing. Brian's face turned dark, and his fist clenched up. I felt like punching them, too, but I pulled Brian back. Mom was lashing around so hard that her shoes fell off. It looked like she might slip from Dad's grasp or pull him out the window. Lori turned to Brian and me. Come on. We ran inside and up the stairs and held on to Dad's legs so that Mom's weight wouldn't drag him through the window as well. Finally, he pulled Mom back inside. She collapsed onto the floor. He tried to kill me, Mom sobbed. Your father wants to watch me die. I didn't push her. Dad protested. I swear to God I didn't. She jumped. He was standing over Mom, holding out his hands, palms up, pleading his innocence. Lori stroked Mom's hair and dried her tears. Brian leaned up against the wall and shook his head. Everything's okay now, I said over and over. The next morning, instead of sleeping late the way she usually did, Mom got up with us kids and walked over to the Battle Mountain Intermediate School, which was across the street from the Marius Black Elementary School. She applied for a job and was hired right away, since she had a degree and there were never enough teachers in Battle Mountain. The few teachers the town did have were not exactly the pick of the litter, as Dad liked to say, and despite the shortage, one would get fired from time to time. A couple weeks earlier, Miss Page had gotten the axe when the principal caught her toting a loaded rifle down the school hall. Miss Page said all she wanted to do was motivate her students to do their homework. Lori's teacher had stopped showing up around the same time Miss Page was fired, so Mom was assigned to teach Lori's class. Her students really liked her. She had the same philosophy about educating children that she had about rearing them. She thought rules and discipline held people back and felt that the best way to let children fulfill their potential was by providing freedom. She didn't care if her students were late or didn't do their homework. If they wanted to act out, that was fine with her as long as they didn't hurt anyone else. Mom was all the time hugging her students and letting them know how wonderful and special she thought they were. She'd tell the Mexican kids never to let anyone say they weren't as good as white kids. She'd tell the Navajo and Apache kids that they should be proud of their noble Indian heritage. Students who were considered problem kids or mentally slow started doing well. 
Some followed Mom around like stray dogs. Even though her students liked her, Mom hated teaching. She had to leave Maureen, who was not yet two, with a woman whose drug dealer husband was serving time in the state prison. But what really bothered Mom was that her mother had been a teacher and had pushed Mom into getting a teaching degree so that she could have a job to fall back on just in case her dreams of becoming an artist didn't pan out. Mom felt Grandma Smith had lacked faith in her artistic talent, and by becoming a teacher now, she was acknowledging that her mother had been right all along. At night, she sulked and muttered under her breath. In the morning, she slept late and pretended to be sick. It was up to Lori, Brian, and me to get her out of bed and see to it that she was dressed and at school on time. I'm a grown woman now, Mom said almost every morning. Why can't I do what I want to do? Teaching is rewarding and fun, Lori said. You'll grow to like it. Part of the problem was that the other teachers and the principal, Miss Beatty, thought Mom was a terrible teacher. They'd stick their heads into her classroom and see the students playing tag and throwing erasers while Mom was up front spinning like a top and letting pieces of chalk fly from her hands to demonstrate centrifugal force. Miss Beatty, who wore her glasses on a chain around her neck and had her hair done at the beauty parlor over in Winnemucca every week, told Mom she needed to discipline her students. Miss Beatty, who told Mom to submit weekly lesson plans, keep her classroom tidy, and grade the homework promptly, but Mom was always getting confused and filling the wrong dates on the lesson plans or losing the homework. Miss Beatty threatened to fire Mom, so Lori, Brian, and I started helping Mom with her schoolwork. I'd go to her classroom after school and clean her chalkboard, dust her erasers, and pick the paper off the floor. At night, Lori, Brian, and I went over to her students' homework and tests. Mom let us grade papers that had multiple choice, true, false, and fill in the blank answers. Just about anything except essay questions, which she thought she had to evaluate because they could be answered correctly in all sorts of different ways. I liked grading homework. I liked knowing that I could do what grown-ups did for a living. Lori also helped Mom with her lesson plans. She'd make sure Mom filled them in accurately, and she'd correct Mom's spelling and math. Mom, double L in Halloween, Lori said, erasing Mom's writing and penciling in the changes. Double E's as well, and no silent E on the end. Mom marveled at how brilliant Lori was. Lori gets straight A's, she once told me. Well, so do I, I said. Yes, but you have to work for them. Mom was right. Lori was brilliant. I think helping Mom like that was one of Lori's favorite things in the world. She wasn't very athletic and didn't like exploring as much as Brian and I did, but she loved anything having to do with pencil and paper. After Mom and Lori finished the lesson plans, they'd sit around the spool table sketching each other and cutting out magazine photos of animals and landscapes and people with wrinkled faces and putting them in Mom's folder of potential paint subjects. Lori understood Mom better than anyone. It didn't bother her that when Miss Beatty showed up to observe Mom's class, Mom started yelling at Lori to prove to Miss Beatty that she was capable of disciplining her students. One time, Mom went so far as to order Lori up to the front of the class, where she gave her a whipping with a wooden paddle. Are you acting up? I asked Lori when I heard about the whipping. No, Lori said. Then why would Mom paddle you? She had to punish someone, and she didn't want to upset the other kids, Lori said. Once Mom started teaching, I thought maybe we'd be able to buy new clothes, eat cafeteria lunches, and even spring for nifty extras like the class pictures the school took every year. Mom and Dad had never been able to buy the class pictures for us, though a couple of times Mom secretly snipped a snapshot out of the packet before returning it. Despite Mom's salary, we didn't buy the class pictures that year, or even steal them. But that was probably just as well. Mom had read somewhere that mayonnaise was good for your hair, and the morning the photographer was coming to school, she slathered a few spoonfuls on mine. She didn't realize you were supposed to wash out the mayonnaise, and in the picture that year, I was peering out from under one stiff shingle of hair. Still, things did improve. Even though Dad had been fired from the Barite mine, we were able to continue living in the depot by paying rent to the mining company, since not a lot of other families were vying for the place. We now had food in the fridge, at least until it got toward the end of the month when we usually ran out of money because neither Mom nor Dad ever mastered the art of budgeting. But Mom's salary created a whole new set of problems. While Dad liked it that Mom was bringing home a paycheck, he saw himself as the head of the household, and he maintained that the money should be turned over to him. It was his responsibility, he'd say, to handle the family finances, and he needed money to fund his gold leaching research. The only research you're doing is on the liver's capacity to absorb alcohol, Mom said. Still, she found it hard to straight out defy Dad. For some reason, she didn't have her inner to say no to him. If she tried, he'd argue and wheedle and sulk and bully and plain wear her down. So she resorted to evasive tactics. 
She'd tell Dad she hadn't cashed her paycheck yet, or she'd pretend she left it at school and hide it in until she could sneak off to the bank. And then she'd pretend she lost all the money. Pretty soon, Dad took to showing up at school on payday, waiting outside in the car, and taking us all straight to Winnemucca, where the bank was located, so Mom could cash her paycheck immediately. Dad insisted on escorting Mom into the bank. Mom had us kids come along so she could try to slip some of the cash to us first. Back in the car, Dad would go through Mom's purse and take the money out. On one trip, Mom went into the bank alone because Dad couldn't find a place to park. When she came out, she was missing a sock. Jeanette, I'm going to give you a sock that I want you to put in a safe place, Mom said once she got to the car. She winked hard at me as she reached inside her bra and pulled out the other sock, knotted in the middle and bulging at the toe. Hide it where no one can get it, because you know how scarce socks can get in our house. God damn it, Rosemary, Dad snapped. Do you think I'm a fucking idiot? What? Mom asked, throwing her arms up in the air. Am I not allowed to give my daughter a sock? She winked at me again, just in case I didn't get it. Back in Battle Mountain, Dad insisted we go to the Owl Club to celebrate payday and ordered steaks for all of us. They tasted so good, we forgot we were eating a week's worth of groceries. Hey, Mountain Goat. Dad said at the end of the dinner, while Mom was putting our table scraps in her purse. Why don't you let me borrow that sock for a second? I looked around the table. No one met my eye except Dad, who was grinning like an alligator. I handed over the sock. Mom gave a dramatic sigh of defeat and let her head drop down on the table. To show who was in charge, Dad left the waitress a $10 tip, but on the way out, Mom slipped it into her purse. Soon we were out of money again. When Dad dropped Brian and me off at school, he noticed we weren't carrying lunch bags. Where are your lunches? Dad asked us. We looked at each other and shrugged. There's no food in the house, Brian said. When Dad heard that, he acted outraged, as though he'd learned for the first time that his children were going hungry. Damn it, that Rosemary spends money on art supplies, he muttered, pretended to be talking to himself. Then he declared more loudly, no child of mine has to go hungry. After he dropped us off, he called after us. Don't you kids worry about a thing. At lunch, Brian and I sat together in the cafeteria. I was pretending to help him with his homework so that no one would ask why we weren't eating when Dad appeared in the doorway, carrying a big grocery bag. I saw him scanning the room, looking for us. My youngins forgot to take their lunch to school today, he announced to the teacher on cafeteria duty as he walked towards us. He set the bag on the table in front of Brian and me and took out a loaf of bread, a whole package of bologna, a jar of mayonnaise, a half-gallon jug of orange juice, two apples, a jar of pickles, and two candy bars. Am I ever let you down? Dad asked Brian and me, and then turned and walked away. In a low voice, so low that Dad didn't hear him, Brian said, Yes. Dad has to start carrying his weight, Lori said as she stared into the empty refrigerator. He does, I said. He brings in money from odd jobs. He spends more than he earns on booze, Brian said. He was whittling, the shavings falling to the floor right outside the kitchen where he was standing. Brian had taken to carrying a pocket knife with him at all times, and he often whittled pieces of scrap wood when he was working something out in his head. It's not all for booze, I said. Most of it's for research on cyanide leaching. Dad doesn't need to do research on leaching, Brian said. He's an expert. He and Lori cracked up. I glared at them. I knew more about Dad's situation than they did because he talked to me more than anyone else in the family. We'd still go demon hunting in the desert together, for old times' sakes, since by then I was seven and too grown up to believe in demons. Dad told me all about his plans and showed me his pages of graphs and calculations and geological charts depicting the layers of sediment where the gold was buried. He told me I was his favorite child, but he made me promise not to tell Lori or Brian or Maureen. It was our secret. I swear, honey. There are times when I think you're the only one around who still has faith in me, he said. I don't know what I'd do if you ever lost it. I told him that I would never lose faith in him, and I promised myself I never would. A few months after Mom had started working as a teacher, Brian and I passed by the Green Lantern. The clouds above the setting sun were streaked scarlet and purple. The temperature was dropping quickly, from the searing hot to chilly within a matter of minutes, like it always did in the desert at dusk. A woman with a fringe shawl draped over her shoulders was smoking a cigarette on the Green Lantern's front porch. She waved at Brian, but he didn't wave back. yoo Brian, it's me, sugar. Ginger, she called. Brian ignored her. Who's that? I asked. Some friend of Dad's, he said. She's dumb. Why's she dumb? 
She didn't know all the words in a sad sack comic book, Brian said. He told me the dad had taken him out for his birthday a while back in the drugstore, and dad had let Brian pick out whatever present he wanted, so Brian chose a sad sack comic book. Then they went to the Nevada Hotel, which was near the Owl Club, and had a sign outside saying, Bar Grill, Clean Modern. They had dinner with Ginger, who kept laughing and talking real loud and touching both dad and Brian. Then all three climbed the stairs to one of the hotel rooms. It was a suite with a small front room and a bedroom. Dad and Ginger went into the bedroom while Brian stayed in the front room and read his new comic book. Later, when Dad and Ginger came out, she sat down next to Brian, who didn't look up. He kept staring at the comic book, even though he'd already read it all the way through twice. Ginger declared that she loved Sad Sack, so Dad made Brian give Ginger the comic book, telling him it was the gentlemanly thing to do. It was mine, Brian said, and she kept asking me to read the bigger words. She's grown up, she can't even read a comic book. Brian had taken such a powerful dislike to Ginger that I realized she must have done something more than Shanghai his comic book. I wondered if he had figured out something about Ginger and the other ladies at the Green Lantern. Maybe he knew why Mom said they were bad. Maybe that was why she was mad. Did you learn what they do inside the Green Lantern? I asked. Brian stared off ahead. I tried to see what he was looking at, but there was nothing there except for the Tuscarora Mountains rising up to meet the darkening sky. Then he shook his head. She makes a lot of money, he said. She should buy her own darn comic book.